I was practically put out of the room. So you don't resent your aunt being snubbed and humiliated. Oh, Aunt Lily. Karen is rude to me, and you know it. Karen is very kind to you. Oh. And what's even harder, very patient. Patient with me. When I've worked my fingers to the bone for both of you. Yes, to the bone. To the very bone. Aunt Lily. You've talked about going back to New York for a long time now. It's been years. Oh, I'll never live to play on Broadway again. But you will, Aunt Lily. You will. You can go back to New York. So you want to get rid of me? I'm only trying to give you something you've always wanted. You keep uh, talking about the theater and the great new opportunities in television that you're missing. Turning me out. Nice, grateful girl. Oh, how can anybody deal with you? Please do not raise your voice. I shall write to my agents when they have a suitable part for me. I'll... No. I don't think we should wait that long. I'll give you what little money we have now. <laughs> you think I'd take your money? Oh, I'd rather scrub floors first. Well, you'll change your mind after the first floor. Oh, I should have known by this time that the wise thing to do is to stay out of your way when he's in the house. When who's in the house? Don't think you're fooling me, young lady. Any day that he's in the house is a bad day. Let's give it up. I'm tired. I've been working since 6 o'clock this morning. I know what I know. You can't stand them being together and you're taking it out on me. Well, God knows what you'll do when they marry. Jealous, jealous. Aunt Lily. You've always had a jealous, possessive nature, even as a child. If you had a friend, you'd be upset if she liked anybody else. And that's what's happening now. And it's unnatural. It's just as unnatural as it can be. The sooner you get out of here, the better. You are making me sick. And I won't stand for you any longer. I want you to leave tomorrow. No delays. Hello and welcome to Book vs. Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margot P. of ColoniaBook.com and this is my good friend and co-host Margot D. of Brooklyn Fit Chick. Hi, everyone. It is so summer. I am, I am, uh, I'm in Oxnard, California, and I'm at a park where the kids are showing up for their summer soccer games. Aww. I don't know if there's, I don't think it's official play. I think they're just, uh, I think they're just here having fun. And um, we are wrapping up Pride Month. Has New York had their Pride yet? Oh, yeah, we had this last weekend. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they did here in Oxnard too. Uh, San Diego is not till like mid July this year. Um, but we have, this is one, I can't believe we've never done this movie before. No, I but, can't either. Um, but this is a first one. And if you're new, um, and perhaps you didn't know that this was based on uh, a book, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's based on a play because we do a brand new episode every single week. It's something we committed to at the start of the pandemic and here we still are. And so we've had to expand what we mean by quote unquote book to be any literary source that has been adapted into a movie. We will consider it. So uh, a lot of plays we've been doing lately, short stories, novellas, uh, magazine articles, anything that has a literary source we will we will look at. And this is one uh, that we thought would be good to wrap up Pride Week. We're going to be talking about the children's hour. And if you have suggestions for future episodes that you would like to make, we are all ears. There's several places where you can make those suggestions. You can meet other listeners of Book Versus Movie or interact with us on the internet. Yes, you can like our basic Facebook page, but we don't always check it. We're not always alerted when there's a new posting. All the episodes are posted there first, by the way. So there's a private Facebook group you can join to give us suggestions, and we're very interactive there. And we have lots of really loyal fans. We do ask that the whatever the literary source is, it has to be something pretty easy for us to get. And also, the movie needs to be streaming on some major app. It needs to be something easy for us to get our hands on. So private ba- Facebook group is Book VS Movie Podcast. But you can also find us on Twitter and Instagram at both of those places. You spell out book versus and movie. Or we have an old-timey email. You can send us an email. It's book versus movie podcast. Spell it all out at gmail.com. Give us your suggestions. And if you would like uh, a sticker or stickers, let us know. We'll drop them in the mail for you. And if you really enjoy the show and would like to help keep us in books and movies, you can also support us on Patreon. 
Yes, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We have been doing the show nine years now. Next year will be our 10th year. So we have committed. We've put all of our episodes from 2020 and then previous to that is up on the Patreon wall. What's coming up or just recently posted, Little Women, The Ghost of Mrs. Muir, The Perfect Storm, Stand By Me, Stepford Wives, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Turn of the Screw, Psycho, and Silence of the Lambs. They're all now going to be on the Patreon wall coming up. Um, so they're no longer available. So that's just a way we have a couple of very affordable options. It really just helps us with the books and the movies and the streaming and the cost for hosting the show. But if money's tight, if you could just leave us a review wherever you get your podcast, that would be amazing and very helpful. Or just tell people about the show. Yep. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> helps us find our we people. We love that. <laughs> yes. And I just learned uh, on Spotify oh, uh, nowadays that Spotify is actually very popular. It's right up there with iTunes now in popularity with apps. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So you, when you listen to the episode, they give you the opportunity to rate the show there, like within the app. With, oh, nice. So, but you do have to listen to an episode first, which I think probably helps then reduce the number of like terrible reviews people get, which we don't get, by the way. We have really nice fans and generous people. We just recently talked about today's author. Mm-hmm. Um, we recently did, what was the play? Little Foxes, right? Yes. And uh, so we talked a lot about Lillian Hellman uh, for that play, but I would say those are her two best known plays, Little Foxes and The Children's Hour. I own the collected works of Lillian Hellman, but I forgot to put them in the car when I left for this trip. Fortunately for me, it is very easy to find online. I found a PDF of the script for free from some university library. It was very easy to get my hands on. Um, I had never read this play, although I've seen it several times. I've seen both of the movie versions, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But this is quite, it was a a very, I think, well-received play when it first came out. But but for those of you who didn't hear the Little Foxes episode, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Lillian Hellman. we could we could have a whole podcast just about Lillian Hellman. Yes. Uh, she, quite something. <laughs> quite an important writer. Lillian Florence Hellman. She was born June 20th, 1905 in New Orleans. She passed away in 1984. In between that, she was a playwright, an author. She was a screenwriter. She was a political activist. She is one of those people they talk about when they talk about the blacklist and the House of House Committee on American Activities, the anti-communist campaigns. She was very active in all that. She also was a hell of a writer. She was a playwright. This is her first play. She she ever produced it was produced on broadway like right away she was very fortunate she was also a person that read screens screenplays and things like that and she at the end of her life she was a very controversial figure there were people she talked about things in her past she had a book of essays in pentimento and some people had claimed that some of her stuff Maybe it was truthiness or lacked some truth to it. She threw some shade with a fellow writer named Mary McCarthy. But also a big part of her life was she was the partner of Dashiell Hammett, Ashiel Hammett, excuse me, for decades until he passed away. He left her his entire work, so she was in charge of his estate. And like I said, she was young, and she had just been in New York for a little while working in theater when she wrote her first play, and she really just did it as an exercise, and she didn't expect it to be... And it just became this very well-received play. And uh, I'm very excited to talk about it because, to be honest, I've never seen the play I've never seen the movies I this is all new for me so it was really fun to get into it oh that's so interesting I didn't know that I can't remember when I first saw the 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 I saw I definitely saw the the one that we're going to talk about the Shirley MacLaine one first I only saw the these three uh in in coming up to this episode and I had never read the play I had only ever read scenes from the play Mm -hmm. um but I had seen some um when we were when we were working on the Little Foxes episode I watched a lot of of course a lot of interviews with um, Lillian Hellman talking about and and invariably this work also came up in the in the interviews by the way the play is dedicated to DeShiel Hammett so that's how how long they were together yeah um she always contended, and I, I think rightfully so, that the play is about, people always want to make the play about 
and depending on when people are talking about this play, because of course it comes out in the 30s, um, there are some times where people are talking about it as a play about quote unquote sexual perversion. Um, there's a time where that you're where they're talking about you know about lesbian issues, da 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 da. But she always contended that it was a play about gossip, yes. and I think when you watch these three, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And where they change, they take the lesbian element completely out of the storyline. It still totally works. So I yeah. think she's right. I think I, I, when seeing those interviews, I was always like, really though? But yeah, really though. Yeah, yes. <laughs> it turns out. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's talk about the children's hour, the play. She's such a good writer. You know, she just, her dialogue, just like when we were talking about Little Foxes, her dialogue, the way she writes the stage direction, uh, for such a, a, an, a new playwright as she was when she wrote this, it's really sophisticated. Yes. There's also a 1971 version of BBC Radio did a version that I posted in the Facebook group that was excellent. That was like the original material. As I said, she was working on Broadway when she wrote this play. And it's about there's two women. And it's based on a true story. So this is something in the, in the 1880s in Scotland. There were these two teachers that ran a boarding school. And one of their students said that they were in a lesbian relationship. And that the co- gossip spread. The women lost their business. So they sued. And they were victorious in the suit because they weren't, in fact, a couple. But it didn't matter because it ruined their reputations. Because their names were in the papers and all that stuff. And so she was intrigued. I think Dasha Hammett actually told her to read the story and then that's what got gave her the idea this is somebody who really knows about just like the frailties of human behavior that little kids can be just as <laughs> deceptive and uh mean-spirited as, as adults can be we always think kids oh they're so pure at heart like eh. <laughs> Not always. But anyway, so the, the the setting is New England, and there's two teachers. They're Karen Wright and Martha Doby. They've been friends since they were 17 years old. They graduate college, and they inherit one of them inherits this barn, this house. And they get the idea, let's create a school together. And because they, they were trying to look at what their options were in the future, and that seemed to be like, not only can we be teachers, which is one of those professions, they kind of thought that's what women can do till you get married. But they were like, well, if we own our own business, this could be entrepreneurial. Anyway, so they, ha- they run this school, and they also run it with the help of Martha's aunt. Her name is Lily Mortar, and she's a former actress. And uh, battle axe, as my dad would call her, she just kind of. She's an utterly useless cow. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> She's so uh, mean, terrible, lazy. Just, I mean, just yeah. She she teaches classes, but it's like elocution and stuff like you know what everybody could. But she's somebody. I think she's just broke, and she just attaches herself to their wagon. One of them starts dating a doctor in town, and he his name is Dr. Joe Carden, and he is Karen's fiance. And the girl is named Mary, and Mary is one of is right up there with the bad seed as far as yeah, with Rhoda, he, with Rhoda. Rhoda <laughs> as far as evil. And this is like 10, 15 years before that was even written. This is the character of Mary Tilford is just the worst. She, mm-hmm. she's gossipy. She's mean. She's been kicked out of every school and her grandparents, I'm sure her parents don't even know what to do with her. So her grandmother puts her in this school and then she, Mary immediately, like, she forms cliques and she puts girls against one another. There's Mary and then there's, uh, I'm sorry, what's the name of the other girl? There's there's Peggy. There's all these names. Are- Rosalie. Rosalie. Thank you. Yeah. So Mary is being punished because she's constantly getting in trouble at school and she's so mad about this. that And she lies. She lies, lies, lies all over the place and gets caught in her lies and won't... She's given like every opportunity to own up to her lies, um, even with like being told that she's not going to be punished. And she it just completely insists on the lie. And so, you know, I, the teachers are like, well, what do you do? I mean, what, you got to punish her. You can't just let just like clearly we have physical evidence that this was a lie. And, you know, you can't just let that go. It sets a bad example to the other girls. And so um, so they punish her. And it's not like, I mean, my goodness, they don't paddle the girl. They just 
She's not allowed to go on a picnic or something like that, right? And she has a complete meltdown. She fakes having a heart attack. She just... and. One of the things she does is that the gr- there's also the girls are reading a sexy kind of book on the side, which is what girls, kids do, by the way. It's very normal. It's OK. But they're reading this book and they're talking about it amongst each other. And then Rosalie is a very shy girl who has a kleptomania issue, like she steals things. And so she steals somebody's bracelet. And Mary knows that she's stealing someone's bracelet. Mary also knows that all the girls have been reading this book. Then two of the girls over here, Martha and her aunt, Lily, have an argument. And it's because Mary, Martha, Karen, excuse me, is going to get married to Dr. Carden. And she says, I'll still be, you know, going, I'll still be here with you. But Martha realizes like, yeah, she'll get married. Then she's going to want to have kids and they're going to move away and I'll be alone. And, and so her aunt Lily says, you're jealous, aren't you? You've always been jealous when you've had a friend and they make another friend when they have something else going on. And she gets Martha gets really upset and basically says, you need to leave. So the girls overhear this argument and then they start putting two and they put all these things together. And then Mary, because she's so angry that she, you know, she's been punished. She tells her grandmother that the reason she's being punished is because Karen and Martha are having a relationship and all the girls know about it, and they're visiting each other in a room every night, and everybody can hear what's going on, and the grandmother is horrified. And so slowly but surely, all the kids are being taken out of the, not even slowly but surely, like very quickly, all the students are gone. Yeah, it all happens, most of the play happens over the course of like less than 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah, it happens super fast, which is part of the whole thing that you know part of Lillian Hellman's whole point like how quickly these things can get out of control you know a little a little lie um can just destroy so many lives in in just a matter of hours and they confront Mary and then Mary brings Rosalie into it and Rosalie is so ashamed for stealing the bracelet so she just goes along with what Mary is saying. So then they're really screwed. And Aunt Lily's gone. So Aunt Lily can't be there. So they immediately, they, they have the, they're going to sue for slander, the grandmother. Aunt Lily's gone, so she can't be a witness. And they lose their case. This is all spoilers, by the way, in case you don't know. Uh, we, we spoil all the details. The, they go to court very quickly. It's you know, decided they lose. They, they lose. They yeah. lose. They lose their money, and all because of rumors. There's no evidence, and they and and so then they they lose that, and then the grandmother does come back, right? And she's basically okay. So yeah, the the way that the court, and I don't know why it's changed in the movie. I don't understand why they did it this way, but in the play, it's the third act of the play. It's it's now months later. The school is closed. It's been closed for months. Who's the one who's dating the doctor? Mm -hmm. She breaks up with the doctor because she's like, basically, she's like, I can't, we're not going to be able to get beyond this anytime soon. Like, at the very least, let's take a break. Let's take a pause, um, but and not get married like right now. And he's not happy about it, but he goes along with it for her sake and he leaves. Then Karen tells Mary that she's broken up with the doctor and Mary is Martha. so upset. Martha, I'm sorry. Martha mm-hmm. is so upset. Thinks it's a terrible mistake and that Karen should marry him. And Martha has this whole what do you want to call it? She she starts to what she says is she says, you know, maybe they saw something that we weren't aware of. You know, maybe I do have feelings for you that way. And maybe there's something wrong with me because again, this is a time when this was considered an illness, a perversion if you will. And so she's but as an audience member, you also don't know maybe that they've been so destroyed by this lie that it's getting into her mind and it's mm-hmm. she's trying to make make it make sense. Why are, have our lives been destroyed over absolutely nothing? So or does she also in, indeed have some kind of real feelings? Maybe she does. We don't know. Um, it doesn't matter is the point. It doesn't matter if she does or not. What matters is that this lie has caused so much destruction. So they have this whole and it's very emotional and she's she doesn't know whether she's coming or going. She kind of works herself up into this thing. And Karen says to her, listen, you know, 
we got nothing but time. Why don't you go take get go go upstairs, get a rest. We'll talk about it in the morning. And Martha's like, yeah, you're right. She goes upstairs. Now, this is how it works in the play. So up to now, this is the same in both of the both of the movies in the play. Martha goes upstairs and moments, seconds later, there's a shot. A shot rings out. And at this point, the aunt has come back and they're, the totally useless aunt has come back and they have the, she's she's there in the house. She runs upstairs. She discovers Martha. Karen runs upstairs. She discovers Martha. The, the two that uh, Karen and the aunt are just sitting there. They're in shock. What are we supposed to do? What's supposed to happen now? I don't know. Um, I, my best friend is gone. And, and you know, how, how much more? damage can be caused by all of this there's a knock at the door aunt lily goes and answers the door it's mary's grandmother and she looks a mess and she comes in and she's like oh my gosh i cannot believe this the girls have confessed that they made the whole thing up i i'm so sorry i I can't possibly apologize enough i've already gone to talk to the judge in the libel case he's going to reverse the case we're going to make an announcement in the papers i'll give you any money I have, all the money, because she's rich. I'll give you all kinds of money to start a new school and 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 start start over again. And it's so too late. Karen says, you know, it's too late. You know, Martha's dead, and the grandmother. So Martha, Martha's already dead by the time the grandmother shows up to apologize. Martha's dead. She doesn't say Martha's dead for about. She died. You know, she, Martha died fifteen minutes ago. She's right. upstairs. Um, but she says, she does tell her Martha's dead. And so the, the grandmother is like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is, you know, if there's anything I can do, you know, please take some money. Da, 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 da. Karen is like, well, I'll think about it and basically throws her out of the house. And so that's kind of how it ends. Karen says that she'll decide what she's going to do next after she has, uh, taken care of, of Martha's funeral. And so we don't know at the end, is she going to go back to Joe? Is she going to leave this town? We presume she is. Is she Mm going to take some of the grandmother's money? We don't know. She's thinking about it. It's all very up in the air. And it does, you know, as an audience member, you think, well, gosh, what would I do? I don't know what I would you do in that situation if, you know, some some couple of kids who had gotten a hold of a dirty book and let their imaginations run away with them. It could do this. It could happen. It could happen so easy. I mean, look at what happens on social media with people, right? Right. As an audience member, you can't help but put yourself in that situation. But what I'm saying is that the way that the ending plays out is very different sort of in terms of the sequence of events um, in terms as opposed to what we see in the especially the movie that we're going to talk about. Um, I don't know why they chose to do it that way. I, I don't know. I don't understand why, because I think it's so powerful for the the grandmother to come back and try to make amends and learn that no it's too late Martha's dead like this you've allowed you killed this woman right. basically <laughs> yeah um so yeah i i it's so good and it's so well written the dialogue is amazing there's a character in the play much like in what were we just talking about the bad seed there's a character in the play and in the first movie um of the housekeeper mm-hmm. of Mary's grandmother's housekeeper and who I love. And she's like, she knows what's up with Mary. She did not for one minute believes any of Mary's line of BS. And she cannot believe that this grandmother is falling for this girl's lies all over the place. And that's a fun character. She's like a little moment of levity in the, in the play. Cause it is quite a heavy. Um, yeah. This heavy is play. heavy. Yeah, it's very heavy. But um, but I think another thing, another theme in all three versions that we're going to talk about is the fact that the other thing I can't help but wonder is is the fact that these two women like part of the reasons why this is so people believe it so readily is that these two women are running their own business. Mm -hmm. You know, if these were two men running a school. I don't know. I don't know that the rumor mill would have run away as quickly as it had. It's you know, there is unusual. An, mm-hmm, there is an element of, well, who do they think they are anyway? Like what kind of a weird woman wants to start a school instead of get married? You know, um, and that's a very interesting theme mm-hmm. in, in every single version. Anyway, it's, it's terrific. It's I could see why it was such a hit. 
Yeah. It's not just the salaciousness of the of the subject matter at all. It's definitely the plausibility of the plot. It could happen to anybody. That was her whole point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it runs from 1934 to 1936. It gave 691 performances. It was banned in some cities because of the, you know, banned in Boston is kind of a theme, but was also banned in Chicago. These are very Catholic cities where they like to ban things occasionally. But she is then, she had written, uh, sorry, read movie scripts, like I said before. So when they bought, she was able to sell the rights to the play, she said, let me take a crack at the script. I think I can. And they said, look, there's this thing called the Hayes Code. We've talked about the Hayes Code many times on this show. You cannot let a person, a, a criminal can't get away with their bad act. You have ultimately, they have, there has to be justice. So they have to take away that whole thing about leaving it on that bummer ending. So they, she takes, and they also have to take the homosexuality out of it completely. There's not even a hint of it. So, or, or maybe there is, and like Merle Oberlon. Then they're being extremely subtle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe because I, I saw it like right after I first read the play. So it's uh, Miriam Hopkins. No, no, sorry. It's uh, you know, Miriam Hopkins. I'm, I'm trying to figure out. And Merle Miriam Oberlon, Hopkins, yeah. Yes, she plays Martha. Yeah. In 1936 Actually, version, and she plays Aunt Lily in the 1961 version. Yes. Whatever went on in your school may possibly be your own business. It becomes a great deal more than that when children are involved. But it's not true. Not a word of it's true. Can't you understand that? Five hours ago, we had our lives decently to ourselves. Now we have nothing left but the dirt you've made of us. to face this. Say it now. Were you... Were you and Martha ever... Karen, Martha and I have never even thought of each other. I've always loved him. He never knew about it. He never even thought about me. I'm sorry for all of us. a very interesting point uh, which I hadn't considered now and, until just now that you mentioned it because the play was such a massive hit and people knew what it was about I'll bet that people going to see the movie were like well you know what this is really about yeah like, you know what really if going I on. were a lesbian I think, then I would want to see this movie if there's just a right? hint of it yeah I bet the people knew what's what was up and so that it kind of didn't matter that it had been written out of the script um, because people knew that that's what the what the stage play was dealing with that they would have had that in their minds anyway mm -hmm. in watching it on screen but it nevertheless it's an excellent adaptation it definitely has all of the same um, beats as the, the the source material it just doesn't it just the nature of the relationships is a little bit different but it but that's as as Lillian Hellman always contended like that was not the point the lesbianism was not the point homosexuality was not the point and it was about secrets and gossip and and the damage that they, that they can do and um so it's so so if you're listening to this and you haven't seen these three uh, and you're wondering how on earth did they do this with without that element? <laughs> Allow us to explain. It was <laughs> they well, had to change it up. Yeah. Well, so they have Merle Oberlon. Oberlin. Oberlon. She was. She's in what? Oberon. Oberon. Thank you. Beautiful lady. Oh my goodness. And then Joel McRae is the guy that they're, and he's like a doctor slash. He's a guy that like works in the house. Like he he helps them fix up the house. 
You know what we forgot to mention is that the and I think in all of the versions, the doctor is a relative of the little girl's family. Right. He's, he's like the their uncle. cousin. Yeah, he's part of that family. Cousin. Yeah, once yeah, she calls him Uncle Ron or cousin. I don't forget. But anyway, yes, he's related because they all know each other. It's a small New England town. But in this play, in the and so it was also directed by William Wyler, and it's streaming on Amazon if you want to say it. it's called These Three, 1936. And it's just in this perversion, there's a, there's a the kids are gossiping and they're still reading the book and they're still getting ideas. But it's be, it's the idea is that Karen is sleeping with Joe versus sleeping with Martha. Like those two are having a relationship and the kids can hear it and the kids know about it. And that's what makes the parents really upset that they're not whatever. So, but it's the same thing. I mean, they, it's the same thing. Martha still doesn't want Karen to marry him, you know, but it's about because she's in love with the man rather than in love with the woman. Right. Um, But it's all almost entirely this. It's very true to the dialogue. Margaret Hamilton plays the housekeeper. So well. Fabulous is she in that movie? It's, but that's, they're great performances. The little girl Look, William Wyler with the that girl. Oh come on! Who plays Mary? She's so evil. She's like fifteen or sixteen <laughs> when she did the movie, and she was nominated for an Academy Award because this performance is spectacular. Had she played the role on stage? I don't think I didn't see that. No. I didn't see that either because and we know like when we talked about the bad seed that 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 girl, whatever whose name is escaping me, she had played the role on stage. So she really, really knew that character. But this actress who plays Mary in these three is she gives Rhoda Penmark a run for her money. She is so, so evil and conniving. It's fantastic. Yes. And I, I would say also there's a lot of it. So it's. What is her name? I'm, I'm bringing that up. Bonita Granville. She plays Evil Mary. And like I said, she was young. And she went on to do, have a career doing lots of uh, film and television. But she, she, like I said, she spreads the rumors. It's a lot of yelling. There's like a lot of yelling in, in, in both the plays. There's a there's great deal of anger being expressed. But in the end of the play, once again, because of the Hayes Code, you have to, they have to have their comeuppance. They, she gets ratted out by everybody. So everyone finds out that Mary's a liar and Margaret Hamilton spanks her and everybody spanks her and has that moment. And so it doesn't end. As, I mean, there's like, once again, there's a quick trial and they lose at the trial. They come back. I know. I mean, look, you killed a woman. Did you, you get a spanking? Really? <laughs> okay. Just, but but in the in the movie, there's there isn't the suicide. There are, they just because she gets found out before that, and that's how they end the film. And it's great. It's a really if you're a William Wyler fan, I think definitely check it out. I super enjoyed it's, it. So it's well written. It's well directed. It's well performed. It's it's an excellent movie. I can't believe I've never seen it before. Same. Uh, it's super good. It totally works. Right. So let's move it forward. It, they're, they're, it's one of the most popular, but I'm sure actors have these scenes in their, you know, bank in their head, but, you know, for things that they want to do a performance, if they want to do an audition, I'm sure that's absolutely there. So let's go fast forward. In the 50, there's, 50s, excuse me, there's a very popular version of the play that's out, and it's with Patricia Neal. Very popular. And so William Wyler says to Lillian Hellman, Let's do this again. Let's like let's actually make the real movie that we've been wanting to make. And we'll include we can include this aspect to it. And Lillian Hellman had lost uh Dash Dashiell Hammett passed away in the year prior to them like putting the movie together. So she really wasn't able to be in it as much as possible. So it's John Michael Hayes who does most of the screenplay adaptation. And they do include it back in here. I'll say that for me, of the two versions, I much prefer these three, even though. I know. And I can't. It's so funny you should say that. I agree. And I can't really tell you because it, it, they're both excellent films. Yeah. They definitely are. But I don't know. I, I don't know what it is. And I. I've been kind of racking my brains about it because I watched these three kind of early in the week. Should I play the trailer? I, I feel, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me let me think about this a little bit. Yeah, so while Margo's <laughs> collecting her thoughts, I'm going to collect my thoughts. We're going to play you. This is the 1961 trailer for the film.
Just when we're getting on our feet, you're ready to let it all go to hell. Arthur, for God's sake, do you expect me to give up my marriage? This is our lives you're playing with. That's very serious business for us. Can you understand that? I can understand that. And I can understand a great deal more. You've been playing with a lot of children's lives. That's why I had to stop you. I know how serious this is for you. How serious it is for all of us. I don't think you do know. You came here to find out if I made the charge. I made it. I don't want you in this house. Ask her again how she could see us. I was leaning down by the keyhole. There's no keyhole on my door. What? There is no keyhole on my door! the things I think and I don't know this this could totally be me just putting this layer on the second film you know myself and that maybe it doesn't exist at all but part of it to me too because we're talking about these themes the fact that this is a post McCarthy era Mm -hmm. production I can't help but add that that have that kind of play into it a little bit and i think too partly that because it's i don't know i don't know what it is about it that i it bums me out so much more than these three but maybe because i re, i feel so bad for them i yeah. that i feel you know that and maybe it's that in in i would say and, okay, you can't can't count these three because that part isn't in in that movie. But in the original script, um, when you have that section, that really important section of the of the third act, where Martha is really spinning out. Go back to Joe, Karen. It's too much for you this way. Stop talking about it, Martha. Let's pack and get out of here. Let's take the train tomorrow. The train to where? I don't know. There must be some place we can go. I don't know where it is. They know about us. We've been famous. But this isn't a nuisance, and they say we've done. Other people haven't been destroyed by it. They're the people who believe in it. Who want it. Who have chosen it for themselves. We aren't like that. That must be very different. We don't love each other. We've been close to each other. Of course, I've loved you like a friend. The way thousands of women feel about other women. You were a dear friend who was loved, that's all. Certainly there can be nothing wrong with that. It's perfectly natural that I should be fond of you. Why, we've known each other since we were 17, and I always thought that... Why are you saying all of this? Because I do love you. And as I said when we were talking about the play, as a reader, and I I imagine as an audience member, what you're seeing is not a woman who is spinning out because she's struggling with her sexual identity. She's She's spinning out because the lie has become so pervasive that it's making her question everything about herself, including her sexual identity. And I feel like in the Children's Hour, the movie with Shirley MacLaine, and I love Shirley MacLaine in this movie. Yes. I feel like that scene is completely about that she thinks she's a lesbian well, and that she feels sh- that she feels so bad about that and it's not so much that she's struggling that this lie has gotten into her head um and i don't like that i don't you know i don't want her to be suffering because of that it's that's, i guess that's why we were both kind of like because we've talked about covering this in the past, and uh, I think it is that kind of bummer. We should know, like, in the House of American Activities, they didn't just try to root out communists. They were also blackmailing gay people. 
because that they was considered were. a national problem. Like if somebody were to find out that you were gay, you would give up your secrets or whatever. And so it was a problem. I mean, people did have a problem with it. And, you know, like we said, this ba- this play was banned in all these Catholic places. So unfortunately, I feel like they had to add that in there. I felt like I love Audrey Hepburn, I think, is a great choice. And she's really strong Agreed. in this movie I think she's mm-hmm. and James Garner oh my god how handsome and he's so like dumb yes <laughs> bless his heart <laughs> I, this cast is so awesome and then of course like the aunt like how punchable is that woman right you just you just want her kick her booty right out of the door like just kick her out of there she's really she's good so terrible she's she's awesome it's such a great performance and of course the grandmother you know the the grandmother who who plays the grandmother Faye what's, Bainter? what's her name uh, she, this was she, the last role. she has such a great arc too of she is this completely overindulgent you know also in her own way just totally useless woman who lets this little girl run roughshod over everybody and just just wants to ignore all the signs, all the red flags. And then, you know, when she thinks, like she really believes that she's right in, in going and spreading this lie with absolutely no proof, but the word of this completely incapable of telling the truth little girl. And it's all because she can't face the truth that her, her granddaughter is a great big liar and um so she spreads this rumor and she has in this in this movie i I like that she does seem to have some like she understands that she's destroying these lives and she does have some compassion about that i'd like to tell you something mary everybody lies all the time sometimes they have to sometimes they don't I've told lies for a lot of different reasons myself, but there was rarely a time when if I'd had a second chance, I wouldn't have taken back the lie and told the truth. I'm telling you this because I'm about to ask you a question. Before you answer the question, I want to tell you that if if you've made a mistake, you must take this chance and say so. You won't be punished. Do you understand all that? Yes, Cousin Joe. Were you telling your grandmother the truth, the exact truth about Miss Wright and Miss Doby? Oh, yes, Cousin Joe. But there's this like moral overdrive of, but it's about the children and protecting the children that she she can't uh, get beyond. And then when we see her after she has discovered the truth, and I like the way they show the discovering of the truth in this movie, which I don't think is in the play at all. Uh, but she, you see how how haunted she is by that, by realizing that the damage that she's done and how powerless she is to fix any of it right. is she she's it's such a great performance. It's so good. Yeah. But I don't know why. Why did we take away the choice of having Martha be dead at that point? I don't know. I, I think it's so much more powerful that way. Yeah, I agree. I I don't know. I mean, they. I should say that the the performances are also great with the kids. Karen Balkin plays Mary Tilford. She's evil. The girls she's great. are excellent. And then we have Veronica Cartwright, who's been in the business forever, oh. and she's always great. And this is she's always so good. She's, she's so really dang good. <laughs> really good. I she was just born an excellent actress. So they yeah they all bring their their best stuff. I mean it's I. Yeah, James Garner, bless his heart. He's so handsome, but yeah, he doesn't. But he's trying to do the right thing. He was like, look, I'll sell the house. We'll go together. We'll move to some place. He is just, and he wants to take Martha with them. Like he feels protective of both of these women. (laughs) He's a really good guy. And there's the scene, and the scene is in the in the original play too, where where Karen says to him, like, okay, go ahead and I know you want to ask me, go ahead and ask me, go ahead and ask me. But You know, even though, I mean, of course he's going to think that, of course he's going to wonder at some point, you know, it's, but he, he really wants to marry Karen. He really is in love with Karen. And, and, um, regardless of whether he wondered about it or not, um, but you know, it's such a mess. Like it's so much, like we said, it's so much chaos, so much havoc 
that can, you know, as we've seen all too recently, a, a lie can do so much damage and people are so willing to believe it, especially if it's salacious or especially if it's something that seems to make them feel superior to somebody else. Hmm. Well, like we were, you know, all these this stuff about banning drag shows and, and all these things. And we all say, oh, because they're grooming children. We're protecting the children. And then that's like supposed to make everything OK. Your draconian policies yeah. and your judgments. Yeah. Last I checked, that wasn't the number one cause of children's death. No. In the U.S. No. But we're not doing anything about that. That's a, that's a whole <laughs> so, other. But yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so it is. Yeah. It's about focusing on these um, shiny targets. It's a great, I mean, it's we, such we a grew good up with that when work um, of art. you and I were young because th- it, this has been a, they tried to fire teachers for being gay. You knew, and I were growing up in the 80s. Oh, oh, absolutely. All the time. Oh, they tried to stop gay people from doing, from anything. anything. You know, you couldn't do literally anything. If, if, um, uh, you know, if, a gay man was going to sing the national anthem at a ball game. Right. People had something to say about it. Or, I mean, of any manner of things. It was absolutely ludicrous. And, and meanwhile, the real problems that were ailing our society then as now go completely unaddressed because everybody's all fired up about that that moving target over there. Yeah, it, it's such a great piece that way. And, and so prescient of... All, all of these things that you and I are touching on that were, co- were yet to come in American culture, including the McCarthy era. Right. Um, and actually including the uh, including World War II, including, mm-hmm. you know, the things that were going on in, in the fascist countries. Same, you know, it was it was ahead of a lot of that as well. It really, it's such an interesting exploration of our psyche. And I think in particular, the play. So anyway, I guess I'm saying the play. <laughs> I'm going to pick the play versus, I mean, we originally were just going to do the strict uh, up to the children's hour because it's the same title and everything. I'm going to stick with the play too. I I really enjoyed, I'll put it in the show notes, the BBC version that I listened to. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of yelling, a lot of screeching. So you have to kind of prepare yourself. There's a lot of yelling I was going to say this also, Um, Shirley MacLaine, I said she was practicing for Aurora in terms of endearment sometimes. Right? (laughs) With her. I know. Um, Gosh, I love that woman. Yeah. Joe and I decided tonight we're going to be married two weeks after school lets out. So soon. Doesn't seem so soon to Joe. No, I suppose it doesn't. Well, congratulations. Wouldn't it be nice to have the wedding right here at the school? The garden will be in full bloom and the roses out. And we could put up a candy-striped awning. And then goodbye, right, Dobie School. Martha, my marriage isn't going to make any difference to the school. Oh, it will, Carrie. You know it will. It can't help it. But you keep saying things like that. We've talked about all this before. You know, Joe isn't asking me to give it up, and I'm not going to leave. No, of course you're not. I don't know what I could be thinking of. I don't understand you. It's been so hard building this place up, and now just when we're getting on our feet, you're ready to let it all go right to hell! Martha, for God's sake, do you expect me to give up my marriage? No. No, of course not. I'm sorry, Karen. I don't know how I could be so selfish. Please forgive me. I already have. It's been a long day. We both need some sleep. Yes, you're right. Who has the cooking detail for breakfast? I do. Karen. You know, don't you, that I only want the best for you. I know.
But the play, I'm going to pick, the reason I'm going to pick the play, even though I have never seen the play live on stage in its entirety, I never have, um, just based on the basis of reading it, I'm going to choose the play because the play, unlike the other two, even both, even the first version, the play is the only version where I'm, I'm putting myself in everybody's situation. Like I could see, I could put myself in the, in the position of either of the two main characters. I could put myself in the position of the doctor. I could put myself in the position of the aunt. I could even put myself in the position of like the girls and how they, things yeah. got carried away with, you know, I really can see myself, you know, in those situations and not really sure what, what would I do? I'm not really sure what I would do if I were, however years, however old they are, what are they? 10, 11, yeah, something like, like that. Middle school. Maybe? Um, yeah. Like middle school age. I, I always think of them and um, yeah, I don't know what I would do in that situation. And the, and the play is the only one that gives me that pure experience mm -hmm. with every single character and the movies kind of don't. So that's why I'm choosing the play. Yeah. I'm going to choose it as well. I also, and I think I, this was from the movie uh, The Celluloid Closet. That's the first, you know, they, they talked about this particular film. It was also like, isn't being a lesbian sad? <laughs> like, oh, I'm, isn't it terrible oh, I know. to be gay? You don't and, get to have a life. Sorry. Yes, it's a Gosh. misery. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's just like, it does add to that. And it's, it's so, but I, you know, it is. Anyway, yeah, that's what I'm going to pick too. But, uh, yeah. but I'm glad we did it. I'm glad we recovered Me it. Too. This was really interesting. I never knew about these three. Yeah. I had never heard of that film. And it's so good. It's amazing. Definitely check it out. It's super good. It's super good. <laughs> um, yeah. I, wow. Yeah, Merle Erbron is so underrated. Like, people need to know how amazing she was. Anyway. Um, so, let's talk about it. It's going to be July. Yes. Already. I know the the time oh. is flying by. I was thinking about this, Margo, because I was putting together ideas for September. We do banned books in September, and I'm like, that's just mm -hmm. a few more weeks from now. It's not even that long. Uh, so we're no gonna kidding. Do, we're gonna do some YA next, and we're gonna cover Rumblefish from S.E. Hinton. The movie was directed by Francis Ford Coppola. It's very easy to get. The book is easy to get. I'm sure you can get on your library apps and the movie is streaming everywhere. So that's what we're going to do. We just wanted to go to a more current decade, I guess. So definitely check that out. <laughs> I know we've been in the past for a while. Yeah, we needed to kind of go <laughs> more true. current. And you could find us, like I said, please send us your suggestions for what she, we should cover at all those places I mentioned before. Our move, our excuse me, our email once again is book versus movie podcast. Spell it all out at gmail.com. And Margo, where can they find you? You can find me online at coloniabook.com and all of my social media call outs are at She's Nacho Mama. And where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at Brooklyn Margo. My Instagram is Brooklyn Fitchick. My site is Brooklyn Fitchick. And also I am on TikTok at Margo Donahue. And I put lots of clips there of the movies that we're talking about. So definitely check that out. All right, everybody, uh, stay safe. And uh, we'll be back soon with a new episode. Thank you so much for listening to the Book Versus Movie Podcast. We are a part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more podcasts you will love at frolic.media forward slash podcasts. We follow the hashtags Lady Pod Squad and Potter and Family. If you want to support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, go to P-A-T-R-E-O-N and look for Book versus Movie Podcast. We have a basic Facebook page, but we also